Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be introducing Ivan Parinder. He's going to be our speaker today in our RAL seminar. He's actually been our Halavi fellow uh, over the last three months. He's been visiting uh, RAL. And uh, he's coming from uh, TU Delft uh, in the Netherlands, uh, where he's doing his PhD. And actually, he's coming from a group that are uh, very interested and focused on the impact or, or understanding GIS, uh, uh, building representation, and so on. So. It's a very unique and, and very interesting research even has been doing, trying to figure out uh, what the impact of those kind of approaches are uh, in uh, modeling flow and turbulence in the urban environment and uh, what the uncertainty uh, associated with those is. So with that said, I'm going to uh, let Ivan get started with the very interesting seminar here. So, Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Ivan. Uh, uh, thank you, Domingo, for introducing me. So yes, I'm a PhD candidate at TU Delft in the Netherlands. Um, for the past three months, uh, through Halby Fellowship, I was here at NCAR working on building resolving capabilities in urban mi microscale simulations. And today I'm going to give you a bit of an insight into this uh, topic. So just a little bit um, about me before I start, just so you know where I stand. Uh, I've got a master's degree in, in aerospace engineering, well, more aero than space from university in, in Zagreb, from Croatia. That's where I'm from. I specialized in computational fluid dynamics, worked at the University of Zagreb some time as a researcher, CFD developer. And right now, I'm a PhD candidate at the 3D Geo Information group, uh, Research Group, uh, where I work on bridging together uh, 3D Geo Information and, uh, and urban flows. So let me quickly just introduce those two fields. So urban flows, uh, urban flows, we can define it as a, a part of the wind engineering field that uh, deals mostly with uh, challenges such as pedestrian wind comfort is over here, um, urban heat island effects, pollutant disturb dispersion, uh, urban wind energy generation, urban air mobility, and what all these applications have in, in common is that they, among others, they all, uh, they all have buildings there as a central part. Uh, they all have buildings that are explicitly, uh, explicitly models, modeled. And um, the, the research field that deals with those 3D CD models is uh, the 3D geo information, so uh, the other field. And, so 3D geo information focuses on everything that has to do uh, with uh, 3D city models. Uh, it includes, first of all, reconstructing 3D city models. So that means generating uh, city geometries, uh, but also the other GIS-related roles, such as um, storing and, and, and calculating different attributes related to cities, but also uh, on, a, on a building level, denoting different surfaces of a building, for example, so saying this is a this is a roof, this is a facade, this is a window, and then uh, giving different, different attributes to those surfaces, such as, uh, let's say, uh, material type or, or roughness. And, and, and this uh, surface denotion with, with the attributes is something we would call uh, semantics in 3D geo information. Uh, to do that, of course, uh, the, this whole field in, you know, uses its own practices, algorithms, special formats to, to store this data, like uh, CDJSON or CDGML over there. Uh, and, and, and these 3D city models that are generated are then used for all, all different uh, applications other than for urban flow simulations, such as energy demand, uh, noise modeling, flood analysis, solar potential, uh, shadow analysis, and so on, and so on. Uh, but I'm going to focus on, on 3D city models in the, con uh, in the context of, of urban flows. So I would just like, like to lay out some key information over here before I continue. Um, a few, few things to, to remember along the way. First is that there are different ways to model building geometries. Uh, those different ways of, of uh, creating building geometries are going to result in, in differences in flow fields. And what are, we're trying to do here is find out what are the impacts of uh, these modeling approaches, um, if there are any, and maybe what, what uh, specific applications might be the most affected by it. So I will talk about these uh, into more detail now. 
So we typically create building geometries from uh, geospatial data. Here on the left, you have uh, an example of uh, uh, building footprint, and then on the right, airborne uh, LiDAR scan. And just uh, combining the two, you would expect uh, to get something that uh, this sort of uh, represent this scenario pretty well. So this would be something that is uh, our expectation. With, well, the reality is a little bit more different. Uh, what we typically have in, in urban flows, what we typically reconstruct is something like this. So what we do is we take the building, uh, building footprint, we take all the points that are associated with that footprint and we find one, uh, one distinct height and then we extrude it to that height. Um, also, there are different ways to, to create uh, these kind of models. Uh, building footprints can have some attributes, uh, height attributes attached to them, so you can already know your height. Or you can have a number of floors, you know a typical floor height, and then combining the two, you can, you can get your uh, you can get a bu uh, building model. But as you can see the difference of the two. Uh, there's, first of all, there's a tower missing, but also there are slanted roofs. Uh, uh, they're gone. And, and as, as a matter of fact, differences can, can be even bigger. And I will show them to you, uh, show them to you a little bit later. Um, so those are two different buildings. Uh, I mean, there, there's two different representations of the same building, uh, two different levels of abstraction, so to say. So is there a right time for me to introduce the concept uh, that we use a lot in 3D geoinformation, uh, which is the, the concept of level of detail? I'm going to talk about that a lot today, and you're going to see it all over the presentation. Uh, might as well even note it on where you can see around. So um, here they are. So what we typically do is we, we basically try grouping a typical building representation into distinct categories when we talked about, uh, talked about them. It's just uh, easier easier uh, to, to go around this way. Uh, and if we categorize buildings from the previous slide, uh, the simpler one would be something resembling a uh, level of detail 1.2. So this is the, the footprint extrusion. And the more, uh, the more advanced or more like the nicer, to say the nicer building would be level of detail uh, 2.2. So 2.1, 2.2 look a little bit similar, but there are some um, little things on the roof that, that make it uh, you know, differentiated, like having the higher level of detail. Uh, in context of my uh, uh, talk today, it wouldn't be bad remembering also level of detail 1.3. So Basically, this is multiple heights per one uh, per one polygon, uh, multiple multiple flat planes, so to say. Uh, you can think of it as level of detail 2.1 or 2.2. Just instead of having slanted roofs, we're gonna have uh, you know, we're gonna have flat planes. Of course, what we are striving for is uh, having the the best representation of our uh, reality as we can, and we would like to have the highest level of detail as possible. So here are some of the ways of being able to attain those. Uh, if you're lucky enough, you, you might get away with, um, with exist, uh, existing building models. Unfortunately, there's not too many of them. Um, if you're lucky, you're great. But the, the reason there's not too many of them, uh, typically they are uh, involve some sort of manual work uh, related to them when they're created. So it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of effort to uh, maintain those as well. Then um, the second one that would fit in between the, those two mentioned here, and I didn't even want to go that way, is manually reconstructing your geometries. Um, some people, I heard of some people doing it. I, uh, well, yeah, uh, great for them. I, would, I wouldn't really want to go that path. Just way, way too uh, time consuming to, to yeah, obtain something like that. And the third category is the um, automatic reconstruction. So, um, <clears throat> there has been a lot of uh, research in, in the past. What's going on? Okay, there's been a, a quite of research in in the past 15 years on automatic uh, automatic building reconstruction. There's been a number of, of uh, algorithms that were that were proposed, um, and what most of them had in com uh, in common was that they weren't really reproducible. So I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, most of you have uh, come across in your in your academic career of uh, yeah, research like that. It is uh, very nice, very very great stories, but, but they're not really you know they're not really usable in any way. Um, however, um, 
Luckily, some research, the recent, recent research in le- recent years, I'm just going to disregard one on the top. That one was also published not long ago, though. Uh, the recent uh, research um, published a code that was, that was reproducible. And uh, to my luck, uh, the last two that, that are mentioned over there were developed by my colleagues in the research group. Which is great for me. I could just nick one of the, uh, you know, algorithms. But I mean, uh, take it, adapt it for urban flow uh, applications, and, and and use it. Right. Um, so the one that I've that I've been using, uh, that I've been I've been dealing with, is the second to last. So uh, this one developed by my uh, uh, colleague Ravi. Um, we reconstruct buildings in levels of detail 1.3 and 2.2. So yeah, this little notice the little legend or uh, down there in the left corner. I'll try putting those as much as possible just so you don't lose track what is what in terms of levels of detail. <clears throat> so I'm not going to go into de- uh, you know, deep, deep detail on, on how the algorithm works. It's, um, uh, you know, it's heavy oriented to, towards computational uh, geometry, but if somebody's interested, I'll, I'll gladly talk about it later. However, one important thing to, to, to mention about the algorithm uh, <clears throat> It uses the combination of footprints and LIDAR. It needs a reasonably uh, high quality data. And even though it's automatic, it still uh, need, you know, it still contains a lot of parameters. So it, it takes a little back and forth, uh, you know, to, to get your reconstruction right. The building that I showed in the beginning, uh, the nice representation, that, that was the one that was reconstructed with this algorithm. And also uh, we, see, we see this building again here in the context of Delft. So this is our building, um, as my workplace, basically our building at uh, TU Delft, Faculty of Architecture. And uh, yeah, you, you see uh, Delft in the distance. So as I said, uh, the algorithm contains parameters, so you can uh, effectively you know, fine, tune, uh, fine tune your details. It, it contains graph graph optimization, so if you go with strong optimization, you might end up, which is effectively a lower level, level of detail. And then if you go with, uh, so to say, softer uh, optimization, you can add more and more details to your buildings. And in the end, you can actually end up with, with noise in your data. So it, it is a little bit of balance play. And what is showing right here, the building is the Rijksmuseum in, in Amsterdam, the, um, yeah, the famous museum over there. As I said, the algorithm can reconstruct in, in different levels of detail. So you have level of detail 2.2, also you have um, uh, level, level of detail 1.3. So n- you can hear nice, uh, a nice, nice figure that's showing the differences between the two. And also for level of detail 1.3, you can set different, you know, your different step height. So um, <clears throat> this is basically the minimum height between uh, two planes. And as you increase this distance, you, you get Less and less details, and again, in the end, effectively, you can end up with a lower level, uh, lower level of detail. Uh, the building here, that's the Maurits House in, in The Hague, one of my favorite museums in the world. So what my colleagues did was uh, to use this algorithm to reconstruct all 10 million buildings in the Netherlands and then publish it as an open data. Um, you can go to this website over, th- uh, over here, 3dbag.nl, we say 3D Bach. And um, yeah, you, there's a nice viewer and a nice nappy viewer. It works great, and you can see uh, yeah, you can see all, all the buildings with the attributes. Uh, they're stored there. I think it's also worth noting that um, this was done as a side project, so it just fortifies the, the the hypothesis that the best codes are written by a very few people in what they would regard as their free time. And uh, all right, so. We can just use this algorithm everywhere, right? Let's just take it and 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 you now do the reconstruction for for pretty much everything we need. Well, there's a problem. There's a problem with, of course, data availability and and data quality. So here I took out some uh, Wikipedia page that showed the national lighter data sets for different countries, and you can see there are not many countries on that list. It is a little bit outdated, but what is more, ex- uh, you know, along with well, except that there's not more of them, uh, there's not a lot of them, also the resolutions uh, can be quite low. So what we're looking at, uh, resolutions of six, seven, or more uh, points, per, points per square meter, ideally yeah, as, mo- as, as, more as, you know, as much as possible, uh, 10 or 15 or even more, that would be great. So uh, we have this problem with, with, uh, you know, with, with data availability and, and, and quality. 
this is for point clouds. Uh, Bill of footprints are no problem. We have them pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, but on the other hand, US is not doing that bad. So uh, what I'm here showing is, uh, is the overview of, of uh, point cloud data that it is in the US. So a lot of countries is, um, a lot of country is covered. Of course, not all of these uh, point clouds that are there are usable. Some of them are lacking resolution. Some of them have a bad classification. But still, it's, it's better than, than most countries out there. Uh, here's some links that you can, you can use to, to access and, and see this data. I especially like uh, open topography up there. I think it's a, uh, I think it's a, great, it's a great website. So there are a lot of places where we cannot reconstruct buildings in, in higher le uh, level of detail. And what we would like to know, and you know, when is it necessary to go that way? Uh, not just because of data availability, but also, you know, uh, algorithm requires more effort, uh, more computational effort, more, more human effort. Um, so the question is, how do we benefit from you know, better, better representations? So here are some of the re research questions that we, that we laid out, Something, th some topics that I started working on before, worked on here, and I'm gonna continue working uh, in the future. And this is, are these impacts of, of building modeling approaches on field significant? And what specific application in, in urban flow simulations are, are affected the most? So to, to look into this, uh, these questions, um, I've been using uh, Fast Eddy uh, here from all. Um, to, to do this, uh, this uh, case study of downtown uh, Dallas. <clears throat> what we did is uh, the, the passage of the coal front, uh, the case of passage of the coal front in November, uh, you know, November in 2019. Uh, the domain that I looked into was four and a half by four and a half, four and a half kilometer domain. So it is a little bit smaller than, the, than what's been shown here, but it's showing the same event. Uh, inflow conditions. For, for Fast Eddy are created from Wharf. And what uh, we are comparing here are the differences between levels of detail 1.2. Oh, here, here it comes, uh, the cold front. front. That looks amazing. And what we are doing is comparing yeah, level of detail 1.2, 1.3, and 2.2. They're, they're individual combinations. Um, here they are, in case you forgot how they look like. Um, so to do the reconstruction, I used uh, the building footprints. I used the point cloud of, of Dallas that was available. It needed a little bit extra touch up, especially reg regarding classification. Um, but yeah, combining the two, here you have the nice uh, uh, LOD 2.2 reconstruction, and, and you can see everything here, right? Uh, well, let's look more into detail so we have a, a better idea on what's going on here. So I want you to focus on the on the top row over here. It's just the first first example of the building. Uh, so this is one very big building polygon. This is this, this, is this whole yeah you know, this whole structure here basically is one polygon. So when we when we reconstruct in an LOD 1.2, we give it one height and, ex and extrude it here. This is what we get. Whereas when we use uh, higher levels of detail, when we use 1.3 and 2.2, we get a much better representation on how the building would look like. If we're comparing 1.3 and 2.2, you gotta play a little bit, spot the difference there, but uh, there are some. Uh, similarly, for the second row, uh, also another building footprint. So one big building footprint, this is how it looks in, in level of detail 1.2, but then if we go to reconstruct it in, in higher details, this is what we get, so quite a, quite a difference. Just to show you that there are differences between levels of detail 1.3 and 2.2. I used the last row. So down here, you can see some of the buildings that have uh, slanted roof lines, uh, whereas they're pretty flat in, in level of detail 1.3. Also one interesting, uh, like one interesting thing here, there's some sort of antenna or chimney that was, that was uh, re you know, reconstructed in, in 1.3 and 2.2. Whereas when you look at, at uh, 1.2, what it did is just you know, lifted the whole building up. So, uh, along with the task of creating, uh, you know, uh, cre uh, creating those geometries, reconstructing those geometries for the simulation, one of my tasks, of course, was to make it work with Fast Eddy. So I had to write some sort of uh, con converter to, uh, 
you know, translate from the from the formats that we use from from the output of the reconstruction to the input of Fast Eddy. Um, what Fast Eddy uses is the immersed boundary force method to represent buildings. Uh, this means that uh, you know, grid intersecting with, uh, with the, the grid is intersecting with buildings without special refinements and uh, at the boundaries. Um, can, on, you know, in contrast with some typical body fit and meshes that, that people are, are used to in, in, in CFD applications. So here we have a building height uh, uh, representation that can be used with, with Fast Eddy to create building mass for you know, certain, depending on the, depending on the height. And um, yeah, I would like to show some of the footprints for the first slide, but it looks a little bit too tiny. But um, if you look at the convention center over here, you can you can spot some of the difference, like uh, some additional differences as well. It got reconstructed a little bit higher in, in LOD 1.2. So the setup of experiments uh, that we use with, with Fast Eddy also uh, includes different res resolutions. So we are interested to see, uh, you know, how, how the differences in flow fields uh, change with the resolution. So we use revolu resolutions from two to 40 meters. Uh, the, the highest resolution of two meters included 1.07 billion, uh, uh, billion cells. And maybe it's worth noting that the runtime for, for this case, Fast Eddy was uh, less than three days on 64 GPUs uh, at the rancho. So I would say uh, Fast Eddy really lives up to its name. Um, so we were interested in looking at the, at the differences that in the flow fields that are generated by different building models. So everything else in these setup uh, were kept the same. So building, so the terrain, land cover, meteorological conditions, every, everything else was the same except, except the building models. So to, to show the results, I will just focus, you know, for, for the sake of brevity, I'm just gonna, um, focus on, on the five meter case here. If you look at, at the PDFs of, of uh, building heights, um, it kind of goes along uh, with, what I thought be, uh, with what I said before, uh, the difference uh, between level of detail 1.2 and then the two higher ones is a bigger, is a bigger one, and you can see it quite clearly over here. But then if we look at the differences between le level of detail 1.3 and 2.2, there are they're a little, uh, you know, a little bit smaller. Uh, the reasons, of course, they come from the same, say, like same reconstruction methodology. But also, if you think about it, if you have a slanted roof, uh, and when we're talking about two, five, or like ten meter resolutions, you know, those differences are sort of going to be, you know, smoothed out. Uh, that's why it's not. The, that's why it's not so different. Uh, before showing the difference in, in plot fields, I think it would be different. Uh, I think it would be interesting to show the differences in, in building masks at uh, certain heights, certain heights that we looked at. Uh, the green one shows the overlaps between two different levels of detail. So I'm showing the difference with LOD 1.2 and 1.3. Um, and uh, yeah, the red and blue color, different LODs respectively. Those builds and max masks are uh, already discretized uh, you know, discretized buildings from the fast eddy. So we are show, we are seeing what the solar would see, what the solar would solve for. Um, we can see a lot of overlap in 10 meter height. Uh, a lot of overlap uh, happens. Well, uh, if, if if you look at buildings and you know, like building footprints, building footprints are quite similar down you know down at towards the foundations. And then as we go higher up we see more and more differences. As what we see at 40 meters, there are less buildings, but we see a lot more differences, and then even more differences at, at 100, meter, uh, you know, 100 meter height. So I'm gonna move on to results and show some, some of the, the field differences from different LODs. So I'm showing the pre-front conditions. The results are 30 minute, 30 minute average, so from 15 of the full full clock to 44, 45 minute of the full clock. Uh, for, um, full clock. I'm re-emphasizing here that everything else, like everything, was kept the same except for for the building representation. So the first first row here shows the horizontal uh, velocity components for different heights, so 10, 40, and 100 meters. Uh, what we can see is that. Uh, there are some differences at, at the lower height, at 10, 10 meters, but they're not as big. 
uh, what happens is if we have some lo local generation of, of differences, so let's say a building corner that is different from another building, it seems that they sort of get washed out by the rest of the buildings uh, that are around it. Uh, just yeah, due to due, due to present due to present of a lot of other uh, buildings due to mixing, it, it seems to it seems to be washed out. And then, as we as we move further up, as you go to the higher elevate uh, higher you know, height above ground level, uh, we see we see a bit more differences. So we see this wake uh, you know the, with, the, with this wake forming um, behind the buildings, um, uh, and and yeah the the values of those differences are higher. So we have, at 100 meter height, we have even, you know, even more, even bigger wakes. So what, what we're seeing here is, when, when it shows in the red, we, we saw it's the, you know, bias, represent bias or situation where level of detail 1.2 uh, is, you know, the velocity is higher. And then towards the blue, when the LOD 1.3 is higher. Uh, also at the lower level, we have some. Uh, also at the lo lower left corner here, with some, we have some uh, low rises, and we see that the differences are, are, are not that big. So, what, what's what's happening here? Uh, well, uh, of course, first thing, the the wind velocity uh, is lower uh, down closer to the ground, but also uh, the other factor is that we have better overlap between the buildings to to begin with, closer to the ground, and then. Of course, the, the third part, like the third thing that is going on, is the uh, um, uh, just the mixing that happens at lower lower heights. Uh, here, yeah, very interesting. So, when we look at at, at these formations over here, I'll just go one slide back. So they are in LOD 1.3 seem to be some you know, the the very like the very tops of the buildings. You can think of it, you know, um, some sort of antenna or something that is on the roof something that, that protrudes, and it's not there in LOD 1.2, uh, we can see the clear, the clear influence of that. So the wakes forming in, in you know, and in, in wind, wind velocity uh, higher in, in level of detail 1.2. Uh, we, we see the similar things going on in, in the second row, which is the, the vertical component of the velocity. Uh, again, the, uh, when we have lower, uh, lower altitudes, well, lower height above, uh, you know, ground level, uh, those those differences don't propagate further down further downstream. Uh, of course, we're going to have some you know have some spikes if there is a building and if there's a, a wind hitting it. Of course, the wind is going to go along the uh, move uh, you know uh, going to move along the building up and down. So you're going to see this, but we don't see it propagating uh, as we see at, at you know higher higher um, altitudes, uh, higher uh, you know uh, above level grounds, and. Um, uh, what what we nicely also see here is how the turbulence kinetic energy, which is uh, down there on the on the bottom, how it uh, corresponds with the uh, with the wind velocity. Uh, you know, velocities on the top. So if we have a building, um, you know, if we have a building uh, that is there in one level of detail, but uh, you know it, it's missing in another, we're going to have some uh, vortices showing around, uh, vortices forming around that is going to cause the, 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 the velocities around it to be lower. But on the other hand, the, the TK is going to go higher. So that's why, you know, higher wind speed for LOD 1.2. But then on the other hand, down here, we have a, you know, a higher, say a higher TK for LOD 1.3. So what I can show now is uh, you know, some, something just to, to confirm what I've been talking about is just uh, the, the correlations or the heat maps. So the x-axis here on all of the plots uh, shows uh, you know, quantities related to level of detail 1.2 and uh, y-axis quantities related to, to LOD 1.3. And you know, we're showing differences for same, uh, same locations in, in, uh, in our domain. Uh, the scale is logarithmic, so uh, yeah, pay attention to that. And uh, so, what what the results are showing here when when we have when it, when we have values that are along the diagonal line, so one one line, uh, they are pretty much matching. So, for example, here, all right, five meter five meter velocity, uh, LOD one point two. If it's you know five meter velocity in in uh, LOD uh, one point three, then yeah, 
they match along the match along the line. And what what we see here is as we go further up with the height, we we see more of the, so to say the, the smearing of the results, or they get further away from the diagonal line. So here it's we have a lot of we have a lot of uh, results. For example, here that are clustered along the one one line. But then as we go higher. We, we see more differences over here, just moving further away, and here, moving in a further way. But this is also, you know, in the, in the logarithmic scale, so yeah, these, these differences here already, you know, uh, the occurrences of, of, of these cases where they, they match it already falls a lot. Similar, what we see for, uh, similar results, what we can see for the vertical compo component on the velocity, and Again, TKE nicely corresponds uh, with, uh, with the horizontal velocity. So, uh, yeah, lower, lower, uh, lower wind speeds, uh, we have you know, bigger, uh, bigger differences, and then this thing happens at higher TKE. So it's just the, the graph looks inverted. So instead of showing all of these differences for, for different like individual LOD pairs, I'm just going to highlight, uh, you know, uh, highlight one here for, for uh, wind velocity at, at the top. And um, we can see that differences between levels of detail 1.2, 1.3, and the combination 1.2 uh, and 2.2, they're not that different, right? They, they look quite similar. And we look at the correlations, correlations are similar. And then if we look at 1.3 and 2.2, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the differences, the difference in these results is, is lower. And we he, he see here much more results that are, you know, showing along the one, one line. So, um, there's just highlighting the, the thing that I already said before. So the differences between LOD 1.3 and, and 2.2 are not, uh, not that different when we use it. So that was for the pre-front for a post-front, um, uh, we have stronger winds, and uh, thing, uh, we have results that we, we expected. As in, we have uh, larger different lar larger differences, uh, especially you know the differences. You know, the, the, let's say the sources of the differences are happening also here, at the top of the domain, uh, sort of close to our boundary. And as we can see here on, on 10 meters, when they form, when they start propagating again, they quite quickly wash out. So the the mixing there because of uh, you know. Uh, be, just because of the, the reason there are many, many other buildings in the vicinity, this all the differences wash out. Also, we can look this for some of the local differences that are happening, you know, that, that, that are, have their source somewhere in, be, in between the buildings, in the downtown, uh, in between the high rises. Again, when it happens, it sort of washes out between the buildings. Uh, these differences, again, are more pronounced as we go 40 meters. Or even more, we go with 100 meters. You see, we see these large, large wakes forming behind the buildings, and uh, yeah, this this impact is much stronger as we go up. Again, TKE, something that we that we uh, expected. Uh, so, graphs look inverted uh, when we have a lower velocity, we have higher higher uh, TKE, and vice versa. Similar for the correlations uh, results that we have. So, similar things happening as we go higher up. We have more results are going away from the diagonal. Uh, yeah, more smearing of the more smearing of the result, meaning yeah, more more differences as as we go further up. Uh, of course, same 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 results when we look at uh, you know when we look at TKE, when we look at the vertical component component of the velocity. So, I would like to, you know uh, take out a few uh, you know a few key points uh, regarding that. So <clears throat> there are different ways of modeling uh, building geometries, uh, like th th those different uh, ways of modeling building geometries have a significant impact on, on, on our results and in urban flows. Relative differences in flow fields are generally more pronounced at higher heights above ground level. So <clears throat> there are some reasons to it. First of all, there are lower wind velocities to the ground, but also there's higher building uh, density uh, Closer to the ground, and also there is a better overlap uh, overlap of building models simply because their foundations uh, look the same. However, <clears throat> we expect those differences to also be a, a function of the type of ur urban uh, lay layouts. You can think of it as a uh, high rises versus residential neighborhood neighborhoods, and also those differences are strongly connected to to meteorological conditions. Just like a uh, like I showed it for the. Uh, for the cold front, of, of course, faster wind speed is going to have uh, larger, going to have larger differences. 
but also the combination of meteorological conditions, uh, you know, with with the urban layout. If you think of building density, at a, uh, if you think of the density of, of the buildings at a certain point, their diversity, uh, also uh, building aligners, so uh, bu uh, how buildings are aligned compared to relative wind flow. It's also something that might be, you know, might be influencing. So here are the, the, the next steps that we're, we're going to continue working on. And this is, first of all, including meteorological, uh, including morphological uh, parameters, so such as as I said, building density or building diversity, and this something shown on the upper left uh, figure, or you know, including uh, and or including the building alignments with the respect to the to the flow, and this is uh, one of the showing figures from one of the met recently the published methods that that deals especially with this. Then we will also investigate, uh, you know, how how urban lay layout uh, correlates with with meteorological conditions, uh, and we just gonna. Uh, you know, include other areas of Dallas uh, to the investigation. So some of them that are not high rises, some are residential neighborhoods, some are more dense, some are uh, less than less dense in terms of yeah, like building coverage. And um, and of course, on top of everything, what we're going to look at are the uh, uh, you know the effects of grid spacing. So in in respect of what is full result, what is what is filtered and what differences does it have on the flow field and, and different uh, different ap uh, applications? So this is uh, this is pretty much it for me. This is just a, like a, a first results, first insight on what I've been uh, working on. Uh, since this is my last last day over here, I would uh, also like to thank uh, Domingo and, and Jeremy for for hosting me and uh, uh, you know uh, working with me. And, and also, I would like to thank Matthias for, for this opportunity to be over here. And also, I would like to thank everybody here in, at NCAR for being so welcoming, uh, so nice. And you know, I've had a really great time uh, working with everybody here. And of course, uh, just a quick reminder in the end. Don't forget your LODs. <laughs> Thank you, Yvonne, for the very interesting seminar. Uh, hopefully, everyone has, or most of us have learned a lot from uh, this type of, uh, uh, I'll say, yeah, almost like a new type of uncertainty that we haven't been considering uh, too much in, the, in our studies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we typically use LOD 1.2. So, you know, that's, uh, we should uh, this is definitely prove that we need to upgrade some of our tools and look into more complex ways of uh, representing buildings. And, uh, so yeah, thank you even for uh, for all that uh, good stuff and especially seeing that uh, differences in wind speed at TKA they are actually very 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 large. I mean, like when we are talking about ten meter per second differences or five meter per second uh, uh, meter square second square TKA, this is something that uh, definitely we need to take into account and add one more level of uncertainty to the already large number of uncertainties in, in modeling urban flows. So with that, I, I'll be happy to uh, pass around the microphone in case someone in the audience has any questions, and then we can look at Slido. But uh, yeah, we'll take people from the audience uh, first. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk, and I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to meet you um, while you were here. <laughs> I stopped by your office a few times, but it, oh. it just didn't time up. Um, and I've been out of town quite a bit, but I really appreciate the presentation. and. Uh, it, my first question is just related to what um, Domingo was talking about in terms of uh, the impacts, which I was Im impressed with how large the magnitude was. And I was just thinking, well, what, what percentage of the mean flow is the variability? And is it similar for the prefrontal and postfrontal um, cases that you've looked at? Uh. Yeah, thank you for the question. This is this is something that we're gonna I mean, we talked about. It's something that we're gonna <laughs> look at right now, like okay. right, right the next. So, uh, so, yeah, something that we were also interested in. So, yeah, trying to yeah, get extract out the, the extract the mean flow and then just see in terms of percentage how how big those differences are. So, yeah, this is it's okay. I mean, it's not super weak, but definitely it's much stronger than the uh, passage of the yeah. front, yeah, after the passage. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's what Yvonne was saying, that now we're going to kind of non-dimensionalize all, all that stuff and, uh, and, and see it more in the real deep term. But uh, yeah, at plus minus 10 meter per second, even uh, yeah, even with the front, I mean, it, it's a, yeah, very easily a 50% uh, uh, in, in certain uh, yeah, same conditions. Oh, same with the yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. 
this. Thank you, Ivan, for being here. Uh, it was wonderful to host you here and, and give you this opportunity. I'm thinking from a practical perspective. Joby Aviation wants to fly in Dallas, and they want to understand, uh, can they land on a rooftop, uh, et cetera. So are we looking, we need to look at 1.2, 1.3, or 2.2 resolution and how much resolution do you need in fast steady to give them meaningful answers whether they can operate or not so thank you for the question so from these like from these investigations that i've done here so far i think we can say almost certain already that lod 1.2 might not be sufficient for these applications so we are looking at the you know at the highest uh, you know, levels of uh, above ground and here we saw the most differences uh, we see that you know differences in modeling can propagate uh, you know much much further down the domain, much further downstream. So in in, in terms of uh, urban air mobility, uh, so yeah, urban air mobility in in all sizes, starting from smaller drones even to to, to bigger, uh, you know, to bigger to bigger aerial vehicles. I think we we will need to uh, go with with LOD 2.2 there. So the highest we can. Highest we can we can afford basically right now. Any other questions? Yeah, Branko, please. Thank you, Ivan, um, for a nice talk. Um, I have a question about how easy or difficult it was to use LOD 2.2 with the fast, steady, and immersed um, force representation. I mean, in terms of. Uh, were there numerical issues, or you couldn't really represent slanted roof as well as you would like to? So, in terms of fast eddy, uh, first of all, um, once we had building geometries ready, so once once the reconstruction once, once the re reconstruction reconstructions were there, uh, the getting from from these models to fast eddy input was almost the same for all levels of detail. Uh, <clears throat> what, I've, what I've done it was the, uh, uh, sort of say, like the, the, the rasterization, rasterization approach that would take the building geometry and then create the building, you know, the building high representation from there. But yeah, so the, the hardest point was getting, you know, getting those LOD 2.2 ge geometries ready, starting from the input data, starting from preparing the data, Running this thing, you know, over and over again, just to get, you know, get the better, you know, better representations. But then once that was done, getting from there to uh, to fast eddy, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was really simple actually. It was really good. And there were no numerical issues. Numerical really, issues you know, in terms of points being uh, impacted by the force. Uh, no, no. So uh, yeah, what what I made sure and what the the, the algorithm does is that. The buildings are, so to say, there are no holes in the buildings. There are no some errors that might create, uh, you know, uh, say no data points, for example, for for fast eddy. So this this thing was already covered when we started, uh, and and that way, you know, when we were when we were moving from uh, yeah, those uh, rev, those let's say formats that we had, like these building models to to uh, grids for fast eddy. I, I really can't say I had any issues with that. It really looked really good. That's great to hear. One more question, if I may. Since I hear that uh, Domingo and Jeremy are implementing nesting in uh, Fast Steady, and that's for some big cities, we definitely cannot resolve all the buildings. Uh, uh, is there a way to combine um, or maybe use this also to parameterize on the coarser grids and the effects of buildings? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Well, it's, it's actually, uh, if, if you ask in respect of levels of detail, if we can, for example, make it easier, reconstruct a lower level of detail outside of, let's say, uh, the one more region of interest and then go with the highest. That's actually one of the topics of, topics of my PhD research. One of the things that I'm working on, well, some of the algorithms that are developing. So those things will be around soon. When will you have uh, the results and be tied up with your PhD? Oh, you know that's the worst question. Somebody <laughs> asked. <laughs> but 
but soon, hopefully. Any other? <laughs> so I'm curious, you, have you tested this with deeper antibiotic resolution? Because the yeah, level of, yeah. But the ROD, the representation will be also affected by vertical resolution. So I'm just curious how the impact of vertical resolution would be in addition to horizontal resolution. So uh, I've, I've ran most of the cases over there, also ran the, the 40 meter. And at the 40 meters, uh, yeah, we can see that those th those differences as we go coarser and coarser with the uh, uh, coarser and coarser with, uh, with our resolution, uh, the differences are smaller. So sort of something that, I don't know, maybe I sort of expected that, but yeah. So when we look at those, you know, heat maps, you know, those those uh, intervals are like getting narrower and narrower. So yeah, the, the differences between, uh, you know, the, between LODs as we go coarser with the resolution are smaller. Uh, vertical resolution? So, so, so we, when we change the resolution, we change that also at horizontal and vertical. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we're seeing all those effects at the same time. Yeah. Just, I had a quick question. Um, related to the, the highest definition for, was it 2.2? Yes. Um, you didn't show results from the two meter resolution, but I was curious if that one showed a higher impact um, going from LD 1.2 to 2.2. Uh, I'm still running that one, and it's have some, uh, you know, a, a little bit of, got a little, a little bit of issues. Uh, something happened after the, uh, uh, after the maintenance that we had, and after that I had some of issues with running. So I, I've run a few of the cases, not enough to compare them, but uh, yeah, I've just. I guess you, yeah. you'd expect maybe there'd be a bigger impact because you're resol actually resolving some of the morphological differences. Uh, that's, that that's, that's, that's really interesting. It's something I'm, I'm really looking forward to looking, uh, looking forward to, to checking because, uh, yeah, we want to know if there's a big difference, if, if, it's, if this is a big jump from two meters to five meters. Uh, we expect, of course, it's a better representation, have better results, but maybe maybe this jump from five to, to some, from two to five or five to two is not that, you know, that big of a, of a jump. So this is something that really, we are really interested into. And, uh, yeah, hope to find out really soon. Yeah, that's a really great, really great point, James. And, and uh, that was one of the things that we were hoping and, and, and that we we're gonna be learning from with the study, right? Because uh, people from the GIS, they'll be like, yeah, you need centimeter scale to see all the little tiny wrinkles in a window and everything. But when you look at it from an atmospheric perspective and turbulence uh, and like energy spectrum, like can those really kind of tiny, you know, little less than half a meter detail on a building, it, it's gonna add some forcing, but how is they're gonna be able to alter, uh, you know, like more energetic scales at, at that certain range? I mean, that, that's kind of a little bit of an open question. It's uh, more obvious when you do that with, uh, I, need, I need to cheer a little bit, level of detail 1.2 on 1.3 uh, for bigger buildings, right? Because those scales, they have more of an impact uh, with the, in, in the uh, kind of relevant scale yeah. in the energy spectrum. Uh, uh, our hypothesis is that, that as you go finer, those are not gonna play that much of a role compared to when you are like simplifying a building with a lot of details, a big footprint into a single height kind of thing. But uh, even if they're working on quantifying all that stuff, so we're you know, we learning a lot. Okay. It seems like you make me think about this a little more. It seems like there's another added wrinkle and that is the parameterization of the sub grid scale is also going to start to play a role when you start to get down to these really fine scale details and there could be some, I don't know, discontinuities or dis disagreements between what you're representing in the sub grid scale versus the, what you're trying to resolve. It should be small. I mean, the, the, the finer you go, that uh, the notion. So it, it shouldn't be. Care about that. <laughs> I don't know. That's a fair point. Yeah, yeah. Any other? Uh, no question from the online. Anyone else from the audience? Uh, last opportunity? No, I don't know. So you mentioned that you're working on uh, nesting uh, fast eddy. Is there? I see the potential here since the disproportionate differences are at the higher. Uh, 
uh, high building heights that there would be an opportunity for uh, maybe an adaptive kind of modeling approach where uh, in areas of a city where you have higher buildings you would use a, a level 2.2 of detail to to try to get um, nail down those taller buildings but then in areas that are very homogenous and, and lower level you could get by with a coarser grid and, and a lower level of detail as well is that something you're considering as part of uh, the nesting approach yeah that's that's a really good point, and that, that's something that we'll we'll be doing whenever we can learn what really matters and uh, how fine we need to be in certain areas. But that's uh, that's an idea, or if nothing else, be be able to refine uh, over regions of interest, right? Like, like, like then you try to do as fine as you can everywhere, right? And then you nest, and then you go finer into certain uh, uh, regions. But uh, it's like a work in progress uh, that Jeremy and I are, are getting into, and. Uh, uh, we are not planning to apply it to urban right away, but yeah, sooner than later we'll, we'll be thinking about those applications. And uh, that's an open more question than, than uh, answers, I guess. We're going to have to figure out some practical thing. But yeah, you know, from a tactical point of view, forecasting, uh, that, that, that's a definitely, because uh, there are cases where you really care about uh, really fine details and uh, you can't afford running like 10 centimeter earlier over, you know, like a huge city and that's still uh, so been smart about doing all that. So combining what we are learning here with uh, with Ivan, with some of the things, I think it's an opposition rally in a very uh, leading edge uh, spot for uh, for uh, applications in the end. So yeah, definitely we're very happy with the, uh, everything we've learned uh, so far from uh, from Ivan. He did great work. Uh, he's been here working with us. And uh, he's going to go back to the Netherlands and uh, not be that happy with the weather, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, we hope to keep uh, working and you know, like regularly uh, uh, interacting, so so uh, we can all benefit from this uh, really fruitful uh, interaction. So uh, thanks to him and to uh, uh, his supervisor Clara uh, from TU Delft for for you know making this opportunity happen. And uh, if there are no further questions, I'll just suggest we give Ivan a big round of applause. Uh,